Good morning. Good morning. On another rainy Sunday, we were hoping, just like last week, to be outside, but the weather had other plans. So thank you for being flexible, and thank God it is not 100 degrees in here. It feels nice. Uh, but let's prepare ourselves for, for worship this morning. Welcome to the First Church in Sterling, where we are gathered in the spirit of Jesus, committed to creating heaven on earth. Welcome to all who need a church home and to all who call this church home already. Welcome to people from all towns and cities, states and countries. Welcome to all who want to follow Christ, those who have doubts, those who do not believe. In other words, welcome to believers, questioners, and questioning believers. Welcome to people of all ages, races, nationalities, abilities, sexualities, and gender expressions. Welcome to single, partnered, and married people. Welcome to children and babies and toddlers. Welcome to everyone. We welcome you to come as you are to meet this God who challenges us to be more than we think that we can be. We welcome you if you are not perfect, because surely neither are any of us. We know that the church at times has rejected difference and has denied God's promise for itself and others, which is why we say without reservation, we welcome you because God welcomes you as a beloved child. We're especially delighted to see you here if this is your first time with us, either in person or online. And um, we'd like to know more about you. So on, on the way out this morning, uh, you know, I hope that you'll introduce yourself if we haven't met. Um, you can look on our website and join our newsletter our mailing list, and you can keep up to date with all the events that are going on in the church by liking us on Facebook. Just to um, keep an eye out um, in your announcements, we are preparing as a church staff uh, for all of the um, upcoming programming in the fall, um, the return of Christian education, the return of fun events like pub theology and um, uh, other just fun community events. Uh, we'll be having Bible studies and uh, book group and painting with Charlie and all those other exciting things. So just be sure and keep an eye on our church website's event page or on Facebook to make sure that you know when those events are starting up again. But now if you'll please join me in the affirmation of faith as it is printed in your bulletin as we prepare for worship. In the love of truth and the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God in the, in the service, service of, of humankind. humankind. If you peeked ahead in your uh, bulletin, you might see that my sermon is called The World Ending Fire today. So the, it's a sermon about the end of the world, a nice little happy topic. And uh, most of our songs also have an element of apocalypse to them. You know, what happens at the end? Um, so this is a song that I wrote um, using the chorus of another song um, a band called Page France. Um, and this is uh, a paperless singing song, okay? So I'll sing a line at one point and you'll repeat it right back to me, okay? I'll signal that I'm singing if I kind of lean back like this, and then when it's your turn, I'm gonna lean forward and you sing what I just sang, okay? And the chorus is as simple as can be. It's just, we will become. We will become. Good job. A happy ending. A happy ending. You already learned the song. All right, here we go. Let's sing the chorus again. We will become a happy ending. Sing that with me. We will become a happy ending. Sing it one more time. Sing that through one more time. We will become a happy ending. We will become a happy ending. No grave can hold us down. No grave can hold us down. There you go. And the child will wear the crown. Sing 
out loud. And the child will wear the crown. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your sting? We rise with the dancing king. We rise with the dancing king and the chorus. for a song you just learned. Give yourselves a round of applause. Woo. Good job. Now I'll invite you to rise either in, in body or in spirit as we sing this ancient good song, Do Lord Remember Me. We thank you that you fill this space with your presence and let us always remember that you are our constant companion, friend, and guide. Lord, when it feels like the world is on fire, help us to remember the great potential that you endow us with. Help us remember the great power that you protect us with. And Lord, we ask that you remember us even in our times of trouble. We ask all these things as Jesus taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now, beloved, may the peace of Christ be always with you. Please share signs of peace with your neighbors. Responsive reading from the Psalms in your bulletin. Fools say in their hearts, There is no God. 
They are corrupt. They do ab abominable things. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. They know knowledge of all the evil doers and eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the, of the righteous. You will confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortune of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. A reading from the Gospels from Mark chapter 13, verses 14 through 21, and this is Pastor Zach's translation. When you see the abomin abomination of the desolation of the temple, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. And the one upon the housetop, do not let him go into his house to take anything. And as for the one in the field, do not let him return to collect his extra clothes. Woe to those who are yet born and those who are nursing in those days. Pray that it might not come during the winter, for in those days a tribulation will be unlike anything since the beginning of creation or any time God created until now or any time that will be. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the chosen, he has cut short those days. And if anyone says to you, behold the Christ, there they are, you shall not believe it. There will arise false Christs and false prophets, and they will give signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, the chosen. But take heed my words. I have foretold, you, foretold to you all things. But after those days of tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. And then will they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send the angels and will gather his chosen from the four winds and the ends of earth and heaven. Let the church hear with the spirit of saying, Still speaking. you 
someone start clapping? Let's give him a clap. I, I'm, a, I'm a clapper. I, I always grew up in, in country churches in Texas, and we always clapped after music. And when I moved to New England, uh, I was shocked at the silence that, that befell after, after performance music during church. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, in the South, they refer to the North as the frozen chosen, you know, very, very frozen. <laughs> During the height of the Manhattan Project, where the United States gathered its greatest minds to solve the problem of nuclear fission for the creation of a super weapon that we now call the atomic bomb, these great minds were all meeting around, as the legend goes, uh, the table at lunch, and one nuclear physicist with the name of Enrico Fermi asked a really simple question that could not be answered by anyone else sitting around his table. And the question was this, where is everybody? So Fermi looked out into the vastness of the universe, trillions of stars, billions of galaxies, and Upon some of those stars, there were planets that he knew fit within something called the Goldilocks zone, a planet that's far enough away from a sun or a star that it could not be boiling hot, but close enough to the sun that liquid water could exist before it turned to ice. And from this would be the soup of life, that life could arise. But looking out into the universe, scientists starting in the 1940s and into the 1950s realized that there was no evidence that they could see of other civilizations that had risen up and that had begun to do what we might call interstellar travel. And there were no radio signals emanating from planets that we might expect had life. And so the question rocked the scientific world, where is everybody? There should be trillions of planets that fall into these Goldilocks zones. And we know that the universe, since the Big Bang, is 13 billion years old. And our own Earth is only 4 billion years old, which leaves 7 billion years for other planets to develop life in a similar way that we did that might turn into spacefaring civilizations. Why is it that we have no evidence of life on any planet in the universe except for our own? Why is it that the only place that we have evidence of intelligent life or life at all is on Earth? There's a few possible answers that Fermi and his contemporaries gave. The first question, maybe the most terrifying, or the first answer to the question is that perhaps we are it. Perhaps in the vastness of the universe, infinite expanse of planets and stars and supernovas and black holes and trillions upon trillions of Goldilocks planets, perhaps we really are alone in the universe. Terrifying possibility. Perhaps those beings do exist, perhaps alien uh, uh, civilizations do exist on other planets, but perhaps they're so far away and the distances between stars are so vast that there's no way that a civilization far off in the cosmos would have the time to reach us or the time for their signals to reach us. Perhaps we are just too spread apart in the cosmos. Or perhaps there are other civilizations and they just don't care to look for us in the way that we care to look for them. All of these answers to the question are, are terrifying in my mind. But perhaps the most terrifying and the most pressing, I think, to us, the, the most terrifying per, uh, option for the Fermi paradox is what scientists refer to as the great filter. Perhaps over those intervening seven to eight billion years, civilizations rose up similar to us, had the potential to do interstellar travel or interstellar communication, but something filtered them out. Something led to a catastrophic end to their species before they were able to travel to distant stars. This could have been a catastrophe like 
a great tsunami on their planet or a meteor that hit their planet similar to the species ending event of the dinosaurs. In the last year, we've seen how our own species is, uh, is very open to disease and pandemic that could wipe us out. We've seen that that could be a species ending event if let run amok. Perhaps the technology that they invented um, reversed on them. You know, remember the movie Terminator? That's a, that's a possibility, maybe artificial intelligence or a nuclear weapon or something similar wiped them out before they were able to spread. When scientists first started asking these questions just after World War II, we realized that as a human species, we might annihilate ourselves with thermonuclear war. I was fortunate enough to be raised after the falling of the Berlin Wall. So I never experienced the fear of thermonuclear war. But speaking to my parents and people who grew up in the 80s especially, um, that was a fear that everybody had, the fear that the bomb was coming. Humanity has faced potentially species ending challenges before and survived. We know this looking at our fossil record, that we have survived great calamities as a species to arrive where we are now. But for the first time in the 1940s and 50s, we were facing an apocalypse of our own making. Using the combined processing powers of the flesh of our primate brains and energy forces locked inside the smallest units of measurement known to human beings, atoms. In 1950, we were staring down the barrel of a potentially species-ending event of our own creation. A great filter might not come from some outside source, some outside calamity that would end the species, but instead it might come from within. Perhaps humanity is the first of billions of species who came to the edge of interstellar travel and communication. Perhaps we're the first, but perhaps we're one of thousands that came before us in that long distance of eight billion years of time. But perhaps we're facing down the possibility that like them, we might wipe ourselves out before we're able to achieve the potential of our species the potential for us to even move and evolve past our own home planet. Visions of the end of time um, are not new to our civilization. In fact, every generation before ours in recorded history has thought that they were the last civilization living on Earth. They didn't think that a great filter would arise by our own hand or from a meteor or from some weather event or a pandemic. They thought that the apocalypse was coming at the hand of an angry God who would punish humankind for their wickedness. When I was in, in, uh, in um, undergraduate school in my religion class, my Greek professor taught a New Testament class and one thing that people in the class would always ask, especially when we were studying the letters of Paul or the Gospels of Jesus, we would say, hey, if Paul, if we had a time machine and we could go back in time and grab Paul, what would Paul think about blank, enter X, Y, Z? What would Paul think about LGBT issues? What would Paul think about women in ministry? What would Paul think about, you know, the answers go on and on and on. And the answer that my professor gave is burned into my brain. Dr. Miller said, what would Paul think if he was uh, getting on a time machine and we brought him here? Well, the first thing he would do is die of a heart attack because he didn't think that there would be a 2021. Paul and Jesus said that the end of time was nigh, that the end was coming quickly and the disciples better prepare. In the selection from Mark 13 that, uh, that we read this morning, Jesus is full of warnings about the end. He warns about the destruction of the temple. He warns about false prophets. False prophet is something that I'm called very often on TikTok, by the way. We get a vision of stars falling from the sky. 
In Jesus' time, people thought that the stars themselves were angels in heaven. This is where we get the image in Revelation of a third of the stars falling from the sky, a third of the angels of heaven joining forces with Satan. You have a vision that Jesus riffs on from Isaiah of the sun going dark and the moon turning red. Jesus himself heavily implies that the end of time will come within the disciples' own lifetimes. In Matthew 16, 28, he says to his disciples, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It was imminent. It was coming soon, and the disciples better prepare. So imagine Paul on his deathbed wondering, why hasn't it happened yet? And that trend continues on generation to generation. Fourth century bishop Martin of Tours wrote, there is no doubt that the Antichrist has already been born. This is the fourth century, so we've had a few centuries since then. In his book, The Anthropocene Reviewed, Essays About a Human-Centered World, uh, John Green, um, famous for the, the book The Fault in Our Stars, uh, the young adult author, he writes about his own fears of the end of the world growing up, and they mirror my own. As a kid, um, the Left Behind series was the most popular book series amongst um, children in church. Terrifying story. I'm not sure why they thought this was appropriate for children. But I feared the coming apocalypse more than anything else. And John Green writes that um, there was an American televangelist named Harold Camping who was very popular on the radio. And in the 1950s on through the 60s, he um, predicted the world was going to end based on his reading of the scriptures and his numerology and math. The world was going to end in 1994. 1994 came, 1994 went, the end of time did not come. Harold Camping says, oh, oh, excuse me, let me go check my calculations again. He calculated this, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't carry the one. It's going to be 1995 instead. 1995 came, 1995 went, the end of the world didn't come. Excuse me, let me go check my calculations one more time. Harold Camping says, actually, the year 2011 is when the end of time will happen. He predicted saying, five months of fire, brimstone, and plagues of earth, will, with millions of people dying each day, will culminate on October 21st, 2011, with the final destruction of the world. Very specific, October 21st. October 21st, 2011 came. October 21st, 2011 went. The end of the world did not come. And Harold Campling put out a, a notice saying, we humbly acknowledge that we were wrong about the timing. John Green writes, for the record, no individual ever humbly acknowledged anything while referring to themselves as we. <laughs> Camping died just a couple of years ago at the ripe age of 92 with the world not ending as he so desperately wanted it to. But the world ended for him, just not for the, the species as he thought. We always thought at the end of the world, I certainly thought when I was a child, I feared that the end of the world would come as the result of human wickedness. God would get so sick of us that he would say, don't make me come down there. <laughs> now it appears less likely that the world ending fire will come because of God's anger. But instead, we might fall prey to the great filter of our own progress. I said last week that progress at the expense of the destruction of our own habitat isn't progress, it's madness. I'm reading a book currently called Sapiens by the author Yuval Noah Harai, um, an Israeli philosopher and professor. And he marks the, the progression of human history um, beginning 70,000 years ago in what he calls the cognitive revolution where we evolved with our primate brains beyond the limitations that we had had for thousands of years into a cognitive species that knew we were alive. Human beings, since that 70,000 year mark, have been responsible for the end of thousands of species. From woolly mammoths to giant ground sloths, 
saber-toothed tigers, ancient bacteria. How many plant species have we wiped out? We'll never know. What a shame it would be if humanity failed to reach its potential, not because of its wickedness, as we've always assumed, but instead because of complacency with the rising crisis of climate change. What a shame it would be if we filter ourselves out of cosmic significance because we failed to see the dangers of our own unbridled success. As human beings expand around the planet, as we continue to use fossil fuels at the rate that causes the warming of the earth, as we continue to decimate natural habitats and plant species, animals, if we continue to warm our planet at an unstoppable pace, such that the oceans rise and calamity ensues, our world might end, but the world, the earth that we live in, will not. We tend to speak about the end of the world um, at, in the same breath as the end of humanity and the end of the human species. We might very well wipe ourselves out, but we won't wipe out the world. The world has recovered from cataclysms in the past and it will in the future. The earth itself has seen catastrophe before and the earth has survived. The question isn't, will the earth remain? The question is, will we? As a species, Will we remain? Will we live up to our potential? I worry about the complacency that I see around the world with the rising threat of climate change. Just in the last two weeks, there's been runaway flooding in Germany that has led to the death of hundreds of people, directly resulting from climate change. In the beginning of 2020, before the pandemic hit, we saw massive destructions of the Australian outback which led to near destruction of whole species directly because of climate change. We see it happening before our eyes, and yet most people are not bothered to the point of changing their lifestyles or demanding change from our politicians, demanding change from the way that we raise our food, the way that we grow our crops. I worry that this is in part because in the past, we have heard that apocalypses were come from the pulpit. We've heard that God would come down and punish us as a species from the pulpit. And it hasn't happened. First in the early days of Jesus, and it didn't happen. Then in the fourth century, it didn't happen. And then every century after that, in our own century, we've been obsessed with the end of the world, and false prophets have said that the end of time is coming. But it hasn't. And so we've left ourselves with the bad case of the boy who cried wolf. We've heard that the, the world was going to end before, and it didn't, and so now we just don't think it's going to happen at all. We've been the boy who cried wolf. We've been the species who cried apocalypse. And so now nobody is bothered enough by the calamities that are facing us in the, in the imminent future. I think that in order for our species to survive the great filter potential of climate change, we have to simultaneously realize the incredible magnitude of human potential. We have it in us to become a species beyond our wildest dreams, to continue to evolve, to spread out throughout the stars. But we have to simultaneously recognize the power that we have to end our species in a world-ending fire. Our species and thousands of species with us, if we're not careful. This would require that we exercise the better angels of our nature. Because if we don't, in some distant future, some intelligent species on some far-off planet might point their version of a telescope at Earth, our own Goldilocks planet, not too hot, not too cold. They may look and they may see our liquid oceans and our green forests thousands of years after we have decimated the gift that we were given that we call creation. 
they may look at us and say, just like Fermi did to his colleagues, where is everybody? What happened? Why didn't this particular Goldilocks planet produce a civilization? That's a very real possibility. In order for us, I think, to live into our potential, we have to be stewards of the gifts that God has given us. We live on a rock hurtling through space that has the perfect conditions for life to arise. And if we squander that, then we don't need God to come down and end the world in a world-ending fire because we will have done it for ourselves. My prayer is that we live into that potential, that we recognize the gift of this earth that we've been given, and that we overcome the incredible challenges that lie before us in the coming decades so that we can continue to live on this earth and live into our full human potential. Amen. I invite you to stay seated um, as we sing uh, the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And I hope that you'll notice um, the last stanza, if you, if you look ahead, it says, may God haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. The line in that, that stanza that always gets me is, even so. The coming of the Son of Man is presented as this, like, terrible, horrifying thing. Not this great, grand thing that we're looking forward to. It's even so. Despite this terrifying occurrence, it will be well with my soul. I hope that, that you hear that in this, in this great hymn of the church as we sing it now.
church will now enter into a time of prayer. If there is a prayer that, that you would like to share that we can pray for you or your family, um, if there's something that's on your heart that you'd like to share, um, please stand and I'll bring the microphone to you and uh, we'll hear your prayer and I'll say, Lord, in your mercy. And together we'll say, Lord, hear our prayer. Um, and if you are watching on Facebook Live at home, if you leave um, prayer requests in the comments, Pastor Robin and I go back and read those comments and know that we fold those into our prayer life throughout the week so your prayers will be heard. Um, what, what prayers would we like to share with God and one another today? I would like prayers for all of the people that are dealing with mental illness and all of the people that are dealing with the loss after people lose their battle with mental illness. Lord, in your mercy. What else? I uh, pray that my son is at peace in heaven, that there is a heaven, and he's finally at peace there. And I pray that any young people who have the thought of suicide can have the strength to stand against it and continue with their lives. They need to understand what they leave behind. It is not just their life. It's the life of their friends, their loved ones, and all they have met and work with. Lord, in your mercy. Related to Will and Stoney's prayers, I'll say a prayer for anybody who is addicted, um, be it to the pill or the pipe, the bottle, the needle, um, whatever addictions um, are sweeping through our country right now. Um, that folks would find the help that they need to get clean if they want to get clean. Lord, in your mercy. A prayer for my uncle. It's the anniversary of his death today, um, that there may be peace for my Nana and my mom and his whole, our whole family. Lord, in your mercy. I'd like to offer a prayer of safety um, for all those people who are homeless and displaced, dispossessed, that are traveling to try to find a home somewhere and uh, that they may be fed and warm this day. Lord, in your mercy. I'd like to offer a prayer for one of our Food is Love recipients who disclosed to us on Monday that her husband, who was suffering from Alzheimer's, had passed. And um, she came because we're her friends, and she wanted to share with us and um, tell us how much um, our weekly meals meant to her and her husband and seeing us meant to her husband. So I'd like to offer a prayer for, um, for her as she's um, a widow now and alone, um, but also for her husband. Lord, in your mercy. I'll say a prayer that we, um, as a, a human kind, a human species, would not be complacent in the face of climate change, that we would listen to the, the courage and the insights of our youth who call us to account for the way that we treat our planet. Um, I pray that we would adopt this new generation's same spirit to prevent that world-ending fire. Lord, in your mercy. God, we humbly ask that you attend to these prayers given sincerely. We ask that wherever there is heartbreak, you give consolation. 
Wherever there's loss, that you give hope. Wherever there's death, you bring life. We ask all these things with the full knowledge and the assurance of your presence, even in the small matters of our lives. Never let us be concerned to ask for help from you, God. That even as we face trial and tribulation, we could say, it is well with my soul, for you are with us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now I invite you to participate in our offering. Um, there's multiple ways to give. Um, the ushers will be coming forward with the offering plates and pass them. So you can give the old-fashioned way, um, either by putting it in the envelope. You can put cash or check. Um, the other way that you can do it is on the back of your bulletin. There is a QR code that goes directly to our online donation page. And you can set up a recurring donation through PayPal. Um, and that way you can set it and forget it. You don't have to worry about it. I invite you to think of your, your giving to the church not as something that you think about when the, pay, the plates are passed, but maybe over the next few weeks you can meet um, as a household, look at your budget, and say, you know, what percentage of our monthly income can we afford to give to the church? Because when you give to the church as a set percentage, rather than just when you think about it, um, it is more consistent, and it it, it shows that, that you care about the ministry that we do in this church. Budgets are moral documents. If you want to see what a corporation's morality is, look at their budget. It shows what their priorities are. And it's the same thing with our family budgets. I hope that you'll take time to sit around the, the breakfast table with your budget and say, you know, what percentage can we give to the church so that you can support um, not just the ministries of, of Robin, myself, um, but also our many ministries that we do throughout the world um, and locally with Food is Love, La Romana. Um, so I'll invite you now to give and give generously as the plates are passed. sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come near earth has no sorrow that heaven can't hear
Church, our closing hymn this morning will be the song, God Will Take Care of You. And I'll invite you to stand as you're able to sing this, this beloved hymn of the church. this benediction and the benediction is hope I have hope that humanity is up to the challenge of the the calamity that's facing us in the face of climate change I have hope that humanity will not allow itself to fall into complacency in the face of the potential end of our species or our habitable world I'd like to, to share in closing this message of hope um, at the end of the essay that um, this sermon was inspired by, and this is by John Green in his book, The Anthropocene Reviewed. Green says, For most of my life, I believed that we are in the fourth quarter of human history, and perhaps even the last days of it. But lately I've come to believe that such despair only worsens our already slim chance for long-term survival. We must fight like there is something to fight for, like we are something worth fighting for because we are. And so I choose to believe that we are not approaching the apocalypse, that the end is not coming, and that we will find a way to survive the upcoming changes. I'll say amen, and may it be so, and go in peace. <laughs>